my goal when writing Introduction to Film was to have a textbook that would be usable uh, either for someone studying um, the subject at school or for an autodidact who was interested in the subject. Because the textbooks that I found when I had to teach that class uh, at the University of Colorado in the States were extremely large. They were like as big as the Bible or an old telephone directory. And I realized that all well, the students told me, in fact, that they would not buy that textbook. And if they did, they wouldn't read it. Um, the textbooks that were available, these enormous books, were also very, very heavy on theory. And they seemed to have been written by, by people who had never been on a film set. Well, my hope is that people who are, who, who are interested will actually um, read, say, through the chapter to the point where a film or, a, or an extract from a film is mentioned. And then will actually pause to watch the film or to watch the extract uh, before proceeding. I don't know if people will do that, but that would ideally be my, my goal. Like say now, if I write now, we watch Bicycle Thieves, that they'll actually pause and watch all of Bicycle Thieves. Um, maybe that's a forlorn hope, but you never know, maybe they will. I think having an informal and colloquial style is a good idea because academic texts do tend to get pretty dense. Um, the academy has a language all its own, which, which sometimes seems designed to exclude the general reader. I hope that this book is, is relatively easy to read for somebody who, who speaks English as a first or second language. Well, I think there is a tendency to, um, not, on the, not on the part of everybody, but on the part of, of some people on a film set, to think that the film is the most important thing of all. And it's important that we don't lose track of the fact that, that the lives of humans and animals are important and that we have to uh, always retain a sense of perspective so that if anything on a film set does seem dangerous or, or, uh, or likely to become dangerous, that the crew and the cast are empowered to point that out. Um, rather like Rutger Hauer on Blade Runner, where the studio was afraid of a, um, an actor's strike impending. And so near the end of the filming of Blade Runner, the studio decreed that they would shoot for 24 hours straight. And at the end of the 24 hour period, during which Howard was doing his own stunts, leaping 12 feet between, from building to building, you know, on a soundstage, um, the director announced, okay, now we're gonna shoot for another 12 hours. And, and Howard said, no, we're not, I'm going home. And of course he was threatened that he would never work in Hollywood again and all that stuff, but he just said, no, I'm going home anyway. And, um, and he came back the next day and did some of the best work he's ever done. So I think it's important to keep a sense of perspective and not to be driven to insane extremes by, by the financiers or by the director. Film is the unique original art form of the 20th century. Um, and you can't really understand a film without understanding the context in which it was made. I do think it's important to have a, a notion in your head of the timeline of the 20th century. And so I, I invite the reader to create their own timeline of that century, which will then help them to, to put those films in context. Um, because if you, if you, you can't really analyze a film without, without understanding the context of the film, get some life experience, you know? <laughs> because if you have no life experience, what can you do? You can just emulate movies, you know? It's like if all you've ever done is work in a video shop. Um, I mean, you have the experience of working in a video shop, um, but that doesn't necessarily equip you to make really original, thought-provoking and intelligent films. So I think the more you can learn about things outside the medium, you know, the more experience you have of, of stuff other than movies, the better. And one of the best students that I had in Colorado was actually a, a mature student who who was ordered to, oh no, I was actually taking the, the course that I was teaching, the Intro to Film course, but he, was, um, he worked in the recycling department at the university. And so his life experience was quite different and he was a tremendous student. If the director has written the script, obviously they're likely to be very familiar with the script. Um, but it really depends if, you're, if you have a talent for writing or not. And some directors really aren't writers. You know, some directors rely on other people to write the screenplay. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. It just depends on the personal orientation of the director. Some directors have 
great writing skills and others tend to defer to, um, to, a, to a professional writer uh, or to a first time writer or to a friend who's a writer. So it works either way. I think that the director needs to be very familiar with the screenplay, but I don't think you have to be a writer in order to be a film director. Boy, I think if you want to break away from the monoform style of filmmaking, you need to see as many films as possible and not, not recent Hollywood films, because recent Hollywood films and, and many recent British films or, or European films are caught in this monoform trap of very fast editing, everything underscored by music. The music's supposed to guide you emotionally through the scene. And there are obviously other ways of making films. The first feature that I made with students, because I, I was a film student once and we were all making the stuff ourselves, you know, but um, the first film that I directed with a, a, an entirely undergraduate crew and cast, you know, it started out fairly ropey and fairly ragged edged. Um, and then as it progressed, we got better and better, you know, so that by the end of the film, we were really quite, quite slick. Um, the most recent film I've done was shot with students from the University of Arizona and recent graduates from the University of Colorado. And everybody made an enormous effort to make it look professional. So I think that in terms of the most recent film I've made, which is called Tombstone Rashomon, at least it's called that at the moment, who knows what the title will end up being. Um, it looks good, looks good, sounds good. Um, fingers crossed, you know, you'll see that film and you won't know it was made entirely by, by amateurs or almost entirely. I think the director should be king or queen. You know, a, a film is like a Christmas tree, you know, and the Christmas tree is covered with beautiful baubles, all of which are essential to the thing itself. But there's only one fairy on top of the Christmas tree, you know, and, and I think because of the speed with which a film is made and the need for constant decisions to be made, you have to have one person at the top of the Christmas tree making those decisions. Now you could swap that role every day. You could have a different director every day, you know, you could take it in turns. Um, but I think in order for the thing to progress smoothly, um, you need to have one person calling the shots. And I, I suppose that's where that expression calling the shots comes from. Um, but it doesn't have to be the same person, you know, and it doesn't have to be a guy or a woman, you know, or, or anybody in particular, you know, but it does need to be, it does need to be an individual. Um, even though film is a super collaborative process and the director doesn't necessarily, well, in fact, the director definitely doesn't know everything, you know, um, the director is a generalist, you know, the director has to be aware of the whole thing, you know, the entire Christmas tree, but every actor knows their character better than the director does or should. Um, the cinematographer knows much more about cinematography than the director does or should. The sound record is the same, the production designer the same, the editor the same. So it is a, it is a collaborative process, but just in order to move things forward, you need to have one person that, you can, that, that can be relied upon to answer a question when asked. It would be interesting if filmmakers could experience film, you know, because we say filmmakers, but a lot of the time, obviously, things are shot on video now. Um, film is a different medium, and because it's more expensive than video, uh, it forces you into a sort of discipline, which isn't necessarily there with video because video is so cheap or free. The difference between the two, I mean, I can still tell the difference between a film being projected on a screen and a video projection. I mean, the other night I was at the, um, the National Media Museum in Bradford and we saw on an enormous screen there um, a 4K projection of um, The Good, the Bad and the Ugly. And the other day I saw Aguirre, Wrath of God. And again, you know, a brand new DCP um, screened in a big cinema. Um, I can still tell that it's video and not film, but the difference is, is, is not enormous. And I think that um, the most important thing is the story and the quality of the work, you know, the quality of all the different department heads work and the acting, you know, and I'd rather see good acting on video than bad acting on film. My ultimate tip for aspiring filmmakers is to see as many films as possible and as many films from a, of a great diversity, because if all you ever see are Marvel comic superheroes films, uh, that's all you can do. You know, if you come out of commercials or if you come out of videos, you know, rock videos or whatever, that's all you're going to know. 
and you're going to be trapped in this very fast-paced bim bam boom type of storytelling and you really need to introduce yourself to world cinema you know you need to see films in foreign languages you need to see chinese films and japanese films and latin american films and and films from different parts of europe uh, you need to be aware of the Iranian cinema and the Korean cinema and all of this because the more films that you see and, and the more films that you see from, from back in time, from the far off reaches of, of uh, the black and white days, you know, even stretching into the silent film days, the better, you know, because you'll have a much broader experience of the cinema and you'll be able to refer to a much greater variety of films than if you're only used to the, the contemporary product. Um, that said though, I think that silent films in a way are certainly interesting, but they're also artifacts because they lack sound. And for me, um, the films that are most important are, and most useful are films that, can, that come after 1929, after sound came in.